I did walk around and greet most of you, I think, earlier. Uh, you might have uh, wondered about my accent. I am, in fact, Afrikaans. <laughs> Not very Afrikaans. Okay, I'm Zulu. Well, I, well I'm, I'm half English, yes. I grew up in the UK. I'm exactly half. I spent 25 years in England, and I've spent 25 years in South Africa. I am 50-50. That is me. I am Feiftach Feiftach. And I love that. I'm proud to be Feiftach because I love the show. Feiftach Feiftach. I love it. I just love saying it. Feiftach Feiftach. Feiftach Feiftach. Or the Indian version, 49.99, 49.99. I'm so sorry. I apologize. Ikizyama. Um, Uhmolo. Uhmolo. U X O L O. Sometimes sorry really is the hardest word to say, isn't it? I only sp I just English, I'm sorry. I wish I could speak to you in all your languages. And, and most of you are, are bilingual, multilingual, yeah? Multilingual people, yes? Could you, yeah, if you speak lots of languages, you're multilingual. If you speak two languages, you're called bilingual. If you speak one language, you're called English. <laughs> and ekizyama. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So you can see up here, uh, that's us. Three years ago, nearly four years ago, Took me three years to build that track. Here I am with my family. 2013, we set out from Cape Town and uh, we went through West Africa. In fact, let's see, that gives you an idea, 20 countries, 23,000 kilometers in that track, over 22 months. It's a 1978 bullnose track from the South African army. And over the conversion of it, turning it into a house, I also converted it to run on waste vegetable oil. That's what happened. I went with my family, with two children on this journey. We just arrived in Spain a couple of months ago. I did it with my children and without diesel and without petrol. We're the first people to cross Africa in a carbon neutral vehicle. We did it on waste vegetable oil and with a teenage daughter in the truck. Come on. Hey. Battling climate change is nothing compared to dealing with hormones. My God, my wife and her, the same. Once a month, I call in the United Nations peacekeeping force. In the end, I bought my own blue beret. I'd be like, daughter there, wife there. Right, son, let's go surfing. Come on, go. It's crazy. It was an amazing adventure. Really, really amazing. And we, uh, we're now halfway to completing Africa Clockwise, which is the project. We're going to go around the whole of Africa without using any petrol or diesel. It's not easy. I'm not a mechanic. I don't speak anything except English. I'm an idiot. What am I doing taking on something like this? I don't even speak French properly. Out of the 20 countries we visited, 11 are French speaking. How many people speak French? It's very useful. Few of you speaking French. Good. It's very, in French, Chinese is Chinois. Yeah? Chinois. And that is the rest of Africa. Chinois. My goodness me. You think there's a lot of French? Everywhere you go in Africa now, Chinese, Chinese, they're slowly building Africa. It'll be great when it's finished. <laughs> Chinois is French for Chinese. The only people you see driving lorries throughout West Africa are Chinese people and local people. You don't see people like me. I'm driving the truck. Everybody assumes I'm Chinese. I drive through villages in West Africa. I can hear all the children shouting at me. They're shouting, Chinois, 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 Chinois. I'm from South Africa. I can clearly hear, Chinois, 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 Chinois. Where's that AK-47? <laughs> but it was amazing. Difficult, but amazing. I wish I could... Uh, I wish I could speak other languages, but I speak English. But even English isn't enough. You get to Ghana. This is English. In Ghana, there's a... Would you send your children to a peculiar international school? What? The, what, the, what what's a peculiar... Waldorf? Even when you find English, it's not English. In Ghana, look at this. In Ghana, overspeeding. Speeding, no problem. Ghana, speeding, knock yourself out. You can speed as much as you like in Ghana. Go on, speed, speed, speed. But no overspeeding. Overspeeding kills. 12 people die. Ah, it's quite something. So, 
this is us a little bit later on, on the beach somewhere, I can't remember where. Why would we do this? Why would we take on such an incredible, stupid, risky venture through West Africa, trying never to use diesel or petrol, which we achieved, which was incredible, but it took us, like I say, one month per country, 20 countries, and we broke down in every country. It was ridiculously difficult. 1978 truck, it broke down, all, but the bush mechanics, they fixed you. It was fantastic. But why would we do it? Well, family connections was the number one reason to spend time with your family, to build bonds, to build a connection between your family that will last forever and get you through those difficult teenage hormonal years. That's why we did it. And to teach our children a new value system, to show them that there's a way to be happy with less, to take them away from the peer pressure, from the consumerism, from that never-ending hip-hop video of life that they're conditioned to aspire to, the bling-bling and all of that. We take them away and show them a simpler, happier time and an easy existence. And also, we went because of climate change frustration. For years I've been recycling, I've been doing my little bit like all of you, we do our bit, but in the end, we're frustrated. Am I right? We feel helpless, yes? It's hard to feel empowered, it's difficult. Most of you feel like me, you feel like you turned up at Kathmandu after the earthquake with a dustpan and brush going, hello, can I help? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's so difficult to make a difference and to feel that you're doing something positive. So I thought, well, let's get in the truck, get some media attention on climate change in Africa and see if we can change things a little bit, at least change some attitudes. So what did we see along the way? Everywhere we went, people have been telling us, this is here, the kids there, eh? homeschooling. Everyone had been telling us uh, about the change in weather, that there's no demarcation between rainy season, wet seasons and dry seasons are changed. The droughts are longer, the rains are heavier. Everything is changing. They've been telling us a long time. But to see it for yourself, we only got as far as Namibia and we hit the biggest drought they'd had in 2013. Cattle dying, lots of trauma, very difficult. And um, you probably heard as much as me about the extreme weather conditions that climate change brings. And you've probably experienced it yourself. We're having it in Cape Town now. We've had a shift in rainy seasons. We've even had black southeasters. We've had, on record, I don't need to tell you, people will tell you today, I'm sure, about the, the, the way the water has changed. Everything, it's the same unit. There's so much water available, but it moves. Suddenly it's moving around and we're changing. Everything is changing. It used to be predictable. Do you remember when you were children, it was predictable? Yes, you knew. How many of you have been to England? Yes? How many of you have been to England when it was raining. <laughs> Even more people. Yes. I grew up then. It rained all the bloody time. You knew it was going to rain because you're in England. It rains. Winter through the summer. It now, when I was 12 years old, it rained so much. Once, one night, I had a dream. When I was 12 years old, I dreamt that it wasn't raining. <sighs> you never forget that first dry dream. The desert was, look at this. The, the drought was so bad, we drove past this cardboard in Namibia. And I thought, what, they're recycling in Namibia? This is awesome. Look at their recycling cardboard. This is incredible in the middle of nowhere. They're re but it wasn't. It was these two young guys. They worked out a strategy. Because at the end of the drought, it was so bad, they waited so long for the grass to come, their cattle were dying dozens each year. These, these young guys were the first to come up with the idea of taking cardboard and soaking it in salt water. The cattle will eat the salty flavored cardboard and it will fool them into thinking they've digested some nutrition and it worked. It fooled them to let them live a couple of more weeks and they were losing less cattle. From the most crazy idea, but we've got to have extreme measures, we've got extreme conditions and we've got to get clever. And this is Africa, we cope. We mark a plan, hey? The craziest plans sometimes work. Everybody else has been copying them. It just gets them through a few extra weeks. It's like us eating shoe leather, leather on the desert island, you know. It's not going to keep, keep you going for long, but it does fool your system. It's been proven. Huh? But we, we make a plan. You know, the Boer mark a plan, yes? We all mark a plan, yeah? The Boer mark a plan, yes? The Boer mark. And that plan is usually a double brandy and coke, which is a, <laughs> is a good plan. So in Angola, of course, uh, we saw even more. In fact, uh, Rob was talking about shipping water around in tankards. Angola, everybody, tankards, like oil tankards, up and down, everybody's getting their water by road, which is crazy. We walked about a quarter, I think, of Africa, walk half an hour every day to get their water. We were them. 
That's what we did, unless we could find wells. My children got involved, as you can see there, in Angola. And uh, I think it was 2015 when the WEF said that uh, I think the next number one crisis uh, for society is the water crisis. That was in 2015. The biggest crisis for society is the water crisis. That's stated in 2015. Obviously, that was before Trump. We've got bigger worries now. So we, we'd get uh, in Gabon. This is a little example of the Agawi River of us having a beautiful campsite and taking our water. There's me looking skinny after a bit of typhoid malaria and dysentery. It's a great weight loss program if you ever need to lose weight, West Africa. And uh, we suck it up, put it in our tank. There's my son there. Sometimes you're lucky you find a well that's got a pump. So you pump it with your foot. Quite often you pull it up one at a time and we pump it into the truck with our little 12 volt solar powered pump. There we go. Yeah. So the other side of it, when we got up to the wet season in the Ivory Coast, we saw incredible wet season. The floods was something else. We got it to took it to a, a new level. And um, you can see a bullnose track there. That's what I've got, the bullnose Mercedes 911. Everywhere in Africa, if you look into the distance, you can see another track. This is me walking with my umbrella going, oh my God, what am I there? Okay, that's a, Afri that's a highway. That's the main road through to the border and the only road. And it gets worse. We were in a town actually, um, driving through a few puddles here and there, nothing too bad. And then my son had his birthday, I think it was his 10th birthday. And this is after a game of football with the locals in the village. Great fun. So I said to him, it's your birthday. We must go get you some chicken. Because on the trip, we don't, you know, we don't get to eat meat. It's, it's not safe so quite often and it's not readily available. And we don't have the money on the trip for meat. And I, on the trip, I'm basically a vegetarian. Well, I eat fish. What's that called? A hypocrite. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I eat fish and chicken and lamb. So I'm a vegetarian, but I eat pork. And, but I don't eat beef, unless somebody else is paying. So we said, let's get you some chicken. How hard can it be? Go get some chicken. Um, it was quite hard. Turned out that there was a bit of a pothole here. Turned out it was actually a mud hole. And we sunk in up to the diff. And we got stuck for the day. And I thought, okay, we're going to get a JCB, tow us out. That's going to cost a couple of thousand US. Okay, let's see if men can do it. And we got these guys. 15 men, four hours later, you'll see in the video I'm going to play at the end, they got us out. And that shows the power. That is some African power there. We did it. That was a scary time. Look at that. To be stuck in that. This is what happens when you have too much rain. Nobody moves. You have to build your roads again. The roads disappear. Yeah, quite something. So, we went through all of this and we coped. And the next challenge... We went to Liberia, and we had to deal with this. We arrived at the same time as the Ebola pandemic. In Africa, we've had to cope with so much. I think we can cope with whatever they throw at us. That's true. We've coped with this. We've coped with HIV. We're having to cope each and every day. Life is tough, but we mark a plan. I was there for one year, stuck in Liberia. They, bought the, they closed the borders. I had no choice in the end but to leave. To start with, I sent my family out. Um, I sent them back to the UK because we had a place for them to stay in the UK. My mum had died during the trip, so I sent them there. We're proudly South African, traveling with the Department of Arts and Culture, our culture doing shows for the ambassadors, meeting all the South African embassy staff everywhere we go, connected and really proud. But this one time, I had to go to the British embassy and hoi my British passport, which wasn't particularly welcoming compared to the South Africans, I'll tell you. Much more security and a lot less handshakes. And uh, <laughs> no handshakes in Liberia. So it's sad because touch, touch is everything, you know. I went to, uh, I went, um, let me show you this thing from the Congo. Because touch is so important. You know, I came to greet you. I wanted to shake everybody's hand. We didn't have time. If we could have done, I would have done this as well. Yeah, we need to touch. So when you're told no touching, that's quite something. No touching, you need human contact. Africa, we thrive on it. We need each other, we need to touch, we need to communicate, we need to look in each other's eyes. We love to still connect with each other. It's wonderful. So suddenly this, this went out the door and you no touching. And you know, 
Fantastic handshakes in South Africa. We know the South African handshake, don't we? Yeah, it goes there, it goes there, and it goes there. Sometimes it goes here and it does other things. It depends how old you are. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, this normal South African goes there, there, and there. And the Muslim handshake starts there, goes there, and then where's my wallet? And in, when Ebola hit, there was none of that. It was then the fist bump. This is what we had to do, fist bump. That was it. And then the Ebola elbow. And then, don't touch me! And it was really sad. This is what happened. So we had to leave. People were wearing masks, gloves. Nobody would touch you. Nobody would touch, take your money. You had to wash yourself in bleach water going into every shop. It was crazy. I was heat scanned when I finally left. So I went to the British Embassy and I said, look, I think I need to get out of here now. Time is up. I've got to leave. And the guy said, yes, we are evacuating. All citizens must leave. And I swear this is true. In the British Embassy, the man in charge of telling everybody it is time to leave Liberia, to evacuate Monrovia, I swear on my children's life, this man's name was Exodus. <laughs> How's it Exodus? Ex Exodus, right, okay, right. Then you believe. Six months in England, six months I spent in the UK missing this truck, missing this beautiful view. This was oh, Ghana, I think. It was incredible. Missed it so much, and I was so lucky to get back. And um, I mean, so, we saw so many beautiful sights along the way. And I, I, my heart is here, my life is here. This is me and my son surfing. You can just see us paddling. And there we are standing in the sea. This is in the Ivory Coast. Cote d'Ivoire is the Cote d'Ivoire surf team. They're doing very well on the circuit at the moment. Beautiful, beautiful, and to miss it was quite something. Came back and I realized how lucky we are. We forget how lucky we are to be African. We forget how lucky we are to be South African. It's incredibly true. We, a lot of people in Cape Town where I live, they look to Europe, they want to be European, and you know so many people, you know so many South Africans think we'd be better off if we were European, but that's guck, European. Come on. We could be Greece, the Lesotho of Europe. Greece over there. <laughs> We're the Germany of Africa. Is that a good thing? I don't know. But you know, we, we, you've got to be proud. We've got to be proud because there's a lot to be thankful for. We are lucky. And it's difficult, of course. Nobody said it was going to be easy. We do take things for granted and we whinge, but who said it was going to be easy? It's Africa. Nobody's going to do it for you. We mark a plan, we do it for ourselves and we do it together. Yes? Yes, we do it together. That's the thing. And we forget, okay, I came back after three years and I was quite upset to hear the same conversations going on. Nothing had changed. Everyone's still talking about Oscar and Candler. And they're having that conversation by candlelight. Okay, so we haven't got it perfect. It's, we have problems. ESCOM can't keep the lights on. So what? We've got load shedding occasionally. What's the problem? The rest of Africa dream of having a load to shed. They dream about having a shed. We must rejoice in what we have. We're really lucky and we're unique. And I firmly believe we are special. South Africa, special in the world, special in Africa, because we are a first and a third world country together. We are a bridging country. We are unique. I believe we're, there's a dichotomy. There's a duality that exists here that is nowhere else. And that means we are, of course, a land of contradictions. Yes, ESCOM can't keep the lights on. They can't even keep the traffic lights on when it goes out. How third world is that? But it's South Africa. How do we find out when it's time to light the candles? We download an app on our iPhone 6. <laughs> South Africa, it's a land of contradictions, but we must rejoice in what we have. It's amazing. We're a developing country. That's I think we must rejoice in as well. Developing means that we're moving. I believe first world is stagnant. There's not a lot of movement. We're lucky to be a bridging country. We're lucky to have that unique perspective. I think there's a polarizing view from extreme privilege. Those countries don't see the things that we see. And it has broadened my life. And I feel a better, stronger, more complete human being because of my time in Africa. I see things in a different way, and I'm sure you guys feel the same. We see both sides of life, of modern living, of technology. We understand. Example is the, the cell phone paradox, yes? Cell phone technology takes people far away and brings them closer. But it also takes the people who are close, and it moves them 
far away. And we lose contact, face contact, connections with each other. But Africa hasn't forgotten that. And traveling through Africa has reminded me how lucky we are because I think that is our greatest resource in Africa. It's not the minerals. It's not the oil. It's, it's the people and their connections, their understanding. Ubuntu, I am because you are. We are all connected. Our actions affect each other. This is what the rest of the world is just starting to realize so that we can cope with climate change. We've known it forever, and Africa can teach the world that that's the most important thing, to put people before possessions. And this is why I took my children on this journey, to teach them that, and to show them that the modern life, we can become quite disconnected, isolated. You know, when you get wealthy, you build up your big house, your walls, you sit behind, look at the screens, and you don't really connect anymore. That is sad. We need those connections more than ever to deal with what's coming with climate change. I truly believe that. And I feel that I'm lucky. I'm lucky to call myself South African. And so are you. And I'm proud now to call myself African. And so should you be. We are all African. And have a little look just to give you an idea. I've made it as short as I can. But come on the journey with me just briefly. <laughs> Mais le gars tu fais quoi Oh debout la balle debout 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 Dieu pour nous faire ta tibé les coups Oh 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 yeah On va bouger bouger On va bouger bouger On a tout fait on a parlé oh yeah On a tout fait on a crié oh yeah Mais vraiment rien n'a changé Voilà